Okay, very good. So uh, this week, we're happy to have Nikita speaking about existence and uniqueness of exact solutions for the singularity perturbicati equation. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, I'm kind of happy to uh, talk about the subject because of so much blood, sweat and tears that went into finishing it. Um, oh, oh, by the way, incidentally, this is uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very good day to give a talk because this is the first day in my new job in Sheffield today is the official start of my contract. So this is the first time I can officially use uh, affiliation as the University of Sheffield. Welcome, Nikita. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, right. Okay, so, so this is a project uh, which took uh, a very long time to finish and there were several attempts on my part, most uh, incorrect. Um, but then finally, last year, uh, I managed to actually get somewhere with it and uh, prove a kind of existence uniqueness type result for uh, this very simple uh, differential equation, but also extremely important. OK, so let me kind of try to jump into it. Um, so here's the setting. So. What I'm considering is um, it's a first order nonlinear ODE. Uh, it's uh, it's kind of nonlinear in the simplest possible sense. It's just quadratic in the unknown function, um, and it's uh, uh, it's singularly perturbed. Uh, so there's a perturbation parameter h bar, which uh, if you think of it as a small parameter, a uh, small complex parameter. And um, uh, the, the important thing is that it, it appears kind of in front of the, the derivative term. So somehow, uh, because it's a small parameter, you really want to think of um, attempting to take a limit in some way as h bar goes to zero. Um, but, and if you kind of just heuristically uh, naively put h bar equal to zero, then you should kind of think that the only uh, the only element of this equation that makes it difficult, which is the differentiation part, that just gets killed and disappears. And so you, you get something algebraic, which is much easier to analyze. Um, and so the, the principle of singular perturbation theory is to kind of use that to your advantage. Use the fact that uh, you have a family of equations depending on a parameter where, you know, in a certain limit or at a certain value of that parameter, your your problem becomes uh, much much simpler, uh, and so you kind of you you try to uh, degenerate in that limit. You solve your problem, and then you kind of want to go back by turning on the parameter, add all the contributions, and uh, and so solve your extremely difficult what may be an extremely difficult problem that way. Um, uh, so so yeah so this is precisely. Uh, this is like a, a, a very typical problem in singular perturbation theory. Um, so, uh, so my setup is the following. So I have these coefficients a, b, and c. I'll assume that they are holomorphic functions of both variables x and h bar, where x uh, is uh, is in some domain u inside the complex x plane. And uh, I'll assume that it's simply connected. And uh, later, I'll assume uh, additional things about it as well. Um, but for now, just think of any, any domain. Um, and then uh, h bar is restricted to a, a special kind of domain uh, called S. Um, and that's a sectorial domain. So you can think of a sector or something a little bit more uh, complicated than a usual kind of straight edge sector. Um, uh, Geometrically speaking, you, you want to take your complex plane uh, C H bar, you want to take the real oriented blow up at the origin, and then uh, this, uh, the circle at the, at the origin, the, the blow up circle. Uh, on that circle, you can draw arcs. Those are going to be your arcs of directions, directions of approach as H bar goes to zero. And so your sectorial domains, by definition, are open sets in this uh, real oriented blow up. Who's, once you, uh, you take that closure, the closure will intersect this circle of directions uh, and it intersects in some arc. So that's the picture that I have here. 
So you see, this is the complex plane CH bar, but I've blown up the origin. Um, and so I have this circle of directions, um, the blow up circle. And so any, uh, so a sectorial domain is any open set like this, which uh, when I close it, close it within this uh, Riemann surface for boundary, then it intersects this um, uh, blow up circle in an arc, which I call A. And so the restriction that I want to make is that this arc A is exactly uh, opening pi, and I'll center it at the positive real direction. So the fact that it's um, that the, the opening length of this arc is pi is kind of crucial to, uh, to the whole construction, um, and also kind of has to do with the fact that uh, if you look back at your Ricardi equation, uh, the way the perturbation parameter appears in the equation is that it's just a single power, the monomial h bar, single power of h bar, which, which multiplies the derivative term. That somehow is directly uh, correlated with the fact that I want my opening to be of size pi. If this were any other power, then the size of the arc that I would have to take would be uh, uh, correspondingly smaller or larger. Um, anyway, um, so th that's the kind of domain that I'm thinking of. Um, oh yeah, so uh, so I want to make a remark, not focus on it too much, which is um, because this is a singular perturbation uh, problem, um, the actual radial size of this sector S doesn't really play any role. Um, I'll, I'll, I'm always free to shrink the radial size of my sectorial domain S as far as, as I want, just as long as I, you know, it remains uh, non-zero, uh, so that there is some whatever margin, and, uh, and this is crucial. The opening of my sectorial domain remains this half, uh, um, th th sorry, this pi, this length pi. Um, but so, but, but basically, um, uh, kind of in the h bar direction, I don't really care about uh, uh, what's what's happening far away from this blow up circle. So what I really want to consider are uh, I call them semi-sectorial germs. They are, they are they're holomorphic functions in X. So, so the domain U is something I definitely want to fix uh, being unchanged. So things are uh, uh, behaving in X as if they are holomorphic functions, but in H bar, I really just want some kind of germ-like behavior. So, so they're holomorphic functions in X, germs, sectorial germs in H bar. Um, okay. So, um, the types of problems that I want to consider are where the coefficients a, b, and c, so they're not necessarily holomorphic at a bar equal to zero. I am, I am restricting myself to uh, a, a sectorial domain like this. And all I want to uh, ensure is that as I take this limit, as h bar goes to zero of these things, that um, I, I'm able to get an asymptotic expansion for them. So in particular, that means they have a limit, their derivative has a limit, and so on. So I can I can do the full Taylor expansion, except that Taylor expansion is um, is not the usual, it's not a convergent Taylor series, uh, it would be an asymptotic power series. So this space, I, uh, I guess I denoted by A, um, so my coefficients, that's where I take my coefficients. And, um, I, uh, I want these uh, asymptotic expansions to be, uh, as always, at least locally uniform so that uh, in the x direction, I can perform all kinds of operations like taking derivatives or taking integrals, et cetera. Um, and again, um, so this is just for now, this is just the ba bare, bare basic uh, assumptions that I need. I will, I will impose more assumptions later. Also, if you don't remember or you don't know what you know, the definition of an asymptotic expansion, don't panic, uh, I'll, I'll get to it later and I'll actually give you a proper definition and, and several other definitions. So you, you can take that away from, from this talk and, um, and be happy that you've learned something. Okay, so right away, let me comment on something. Um, the, so the most common special case of this is, uh, you know, none of this asymptotic expansion stuff uh, 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 happening. Instead, I, you know, I could have 
um, honest holomorphic functions ABC, holomorphic at h bar equal to zero. Um, in fact, a very common uh, situation is when they are polynomial in h bar or even constant. That is, those problems are extremely interesting uh, when the coefficients are constant in h bar. Um, so, so in that case, uh, these asymptotic expansions, a hat, b hat, c hat at h bar equal to zero, they're nothing but uh, Taylor, uh, Taylor series, uh, Taylor expansions at h bar equal to zero, and, th and then they would be convergent. Um, but somehow I want to, I really want to uh, put myself in this much more general framework, uh, not because I am insane, uh, although that may also be the case, uh, but because uh, somehow uh, the, the the class of problems that I will focus on somehow is a very, um, in some sense, is the correct class to look at because the, uh, in some sense, the the kind of the input, the regularity of the input data is going to be the same as the regularity of the output data. So by by doing, uh, by placing the correct assumptions on the coefficients a, b, and c of certain regularity, um, I'll construct solutions which have the same regularity. So you kind of stay within the same regularity class. Um, and, um, and I guess uh, an important thing that I want to say is that even if I do um, restrict myself to, you know, maybe a more familiar situation where A, B, and C are holomorphic or even constant in H bar, then um, the proof of the main result doesn't get simplified at all. And probably even more importantly, the, the statement doesn't get any stronger. So somehow, if you restrict yourself to a, a smaller class of holomorphic things at h bar, you don't really get anything, um, anything stronger. OK. So, uh, so and, I, and that actually kind of brings me to the main difficulty in the whole, uh, the whole problem and the whole subject is that you kind of, uh, if, if you were to expect holomorphic solutions, solutions that behave holomorphically at h bar equal to zero, then you might as well try to solve for them as power series in h bar. So just find its, power, its uh, Taylor series at h bar equal to zero. So you can try to do that. You plug that in to the Riccati equation. Um, and you find very quickly that unless you're in some extremely degenerate uh, situations, um, the, the, the power series solution that you uh, get is divergent, has zero radius of convergence. Um, so it certainly cannot be interpreted as a holomorphic object. And so uh, the idea uh, is to uh, interpret these divergent power series as uh, not solutions themselves, but rather asymptotic expansions of uh, actual holomorphic solutions in, in sectors. And so these are the these are exactly the uh, the kind of solutions that I'm looking for, and that's that's what I call exact solutions. So by definition. Uh, an exact solution is a solution which is um, uh, holomorphic in uh, in uh, uh, this type of domain U cross uh, a, a sectorial domain, um, and it admits an asymptotic expansion as h bar goes to zero along this arc A. Um, okay, so that's the goal. And um, then the main result is, uh, roughly speaking, an existence and uniqueness theorem which, um, so if I do go ahead and try to solve my Riccati equation formally, so just plug in a power series and compute the coefficients, that's really not so difficult to do. Uh, so you do that, you find a formal solution. Um, and so the, the statement is that once, if you give me one of these formal solutions, f hat, I want to interpret it as, a, as an asymptotic expansion of an actual solution. And uh, well, provided some conditions, which I'll describe in detail, uh, there is a canonical exact solution which has this uh, formal power series f, f hat as its asymptotic expansion. And uh, uh, canonical uh, here means that uh, given so it, it is the unique solution which satisfies some additional um, regularity conditions. So basically, that's. Um, yeah, that's the outlook. Okay, so I don't really want to, um, yeah, I mean, motivating uh, why you would care about the Riccati equation uh, would take a long time. So I'll just say just a couple of very brief words. If you are interested in 
the exact WKB analysis of ODEs, in particular the Schrodinger equation. So something that has been uh, you know, subject of a lot of research uh, recently. Um, then you are inevitably, I mean, it, 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 the analysis of the Riccati, of this singularly perturbed Riccati equation completely underpins the exact business of, uh, all of the business of the exact WKB analysis. So you, you have to uh, be able to do that analysis. And then more generally, you can, you know, you can graduate from um, ODEs, from the Schrodinger equation to uh, neuromorphic connections that depend on the parameter H bar on vector bundles. Um, and then you could be studying abelianization where you try to uh, rewrite a rank N or, or at least rank two a meromorphic connection as a rank one connection on some covering space. And again, uh, singular, singularly perturbed Riccati equations are, uh, you know, lots of operations boil down to being able to solve them. So, okay, so there are a, a couple of other remarks that I wanted to make, but maybe I'll just skip them. Um, so let me instead let me just tell you kind of the general strategy of how how one goes about doing this. So how do you convert a formal solution, a formal power series, a non-analytic object into something that is analytic? So uh, this method is called uh, Borel-Laplace method or Borel resummation, and it basically goes like this. So step one, you uh, solve your Riccati equation formally. So you find a formal power series that satisfies it. That's pretty easy to do. Um, then uh, step two is you apply uh, an operation to it, which is called a formal, formal Borel transform. I'll define what that is. Um, some kind of transform um, does something to uh, the coefficients. And you get uh, some other power series, f hat, in, uh, uh, in the new variable xi. Um, the, the call, they call it the Borel variable. Um, and uh, so if you're lucky, if, if your Riccati equation has sufficient regularity, uh, then it turns out that uh, this f hat uh, becomes a uniformly convergent power series in Xi. So you should think that, you know, here, here I have a picture uh, in the Xi plane. So this is, this is the positive, whatever, po positive real ray. This is the origin. So near the origin, this thing uniformly converges in some small disk to an actual analytic object. Um, okay, so again, that's not so hard to achieve. Um, and then you get to step number three, and that's when things begin to get very difficult. Um, so what you need to do is you need to take this uh, analytic object defined in this small, uh, small disk near the origin, and you need to uh, analytically continue it along the positive real ray all the way to infinity. Um, so, so in other words, you want to define some holomorphic object, uh, not just in this little disk, but in this kind of uh, tubular neighborhood of uh, the positive real ray of some uh, definite thickness. Um, and um, so, you know, this may not happen, and this often does not happen, but if you put the correct, put uh, enough uh, regularity assumptions on your coefficients, it is possible to achieve this, uh, but it is quite hard. So this is probably the hardest step in the whole bit, in the whole Borel Laplace uh, method, uh, simply because analytically continuing functions is generally difficult business. Okay, but even if, so even if you manage to achieve this, even if you've managed to uh, analytically continue this function, uh, this germ phi to this tubular neighborhood of the real positive real axis, you're still not done. Uh, because uh, the, the next step that you need to do is you basically need to undo this Borel uh, transformation that you applied earlier. You kind of need to essentially apply uh, an inverse Borel uh, transformation to it. Um, uh, and in some very definite sense, uh, the inverse of the Borel transformation is uh, a Laplace transform, which hopefully you're familiar with. So what you need to do is basically I take this holomorphic object phi defined, you know, in a neighborhood of the positive real axis, and I, and I integrate it against this kernel. 
Um, and uh, uh, so I call that object capital F. Uh, now that thing depends on uh, X and H bar. Um, of course, that thing may not exist. I mean, usually it doesn't exist. Unless, um, again, your Riccati equation has sufficient uh, regularity. Um, in particular, uh, you can show that if you, if you put correct uh, assumptions on your coefficients, you can show that this uh, analytic continuation phi doesn't grow too fast as uh, S psi goes off to infinity. Um, I mean, in particular, you basically need this exponential kernel to uh, squash any kind of growth at infinity. So you, um, so it has to have uh, at most exponential growth. Um, but anyway, but that that can be done uh, with the right assumptions. Um, and then basically, that's that's the end. Uh, that's the end of the operation. Uh, the result is that you take this uh, function f, capital F, which I cooked up in this very bizarre. Uh, set of operations. Um, I need to add to it the leading order term F0 because that somehow that gets uh, omitted in the Borel-Laplace operation. It doesn't see the leading order term, so you need to add it. But once you add uh, the leading order term to this uh, Laplace transform uh, object, um, then you get a function F, a holomorphic function F, which is a solution of the Riccati equation, and it does admit an asymptotic expansion, and its expansion is precisely f hat. Um, so this, this is an exact solution. Um, and in this case, um, often we say that the solution, this uh, exact solution f is the Borel resummation of f hat. So it's a very complicated sequence of operations that need to be done very carefully. Um, and some of, the, some of them are very hard. Um, and uh, you know, to, as an extra challenge, uh, we want to do everything uh, uniformly in the variable x, so that we can actually, because our differential equation is with respect to the variable x, so we inevitably want to differentiate things or integrate things and do all kinds of operations in the x direction. And if if we cannot do this process uniformly, then uh, yeah, to 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 put it this way, the fact that uh, this exact solution f is the Borel resummation of some uh, formal power series is kind of useless in that um, rather useless information. Instead, if we have uniformity, then uh, we can do operations in the, in the x variable on this formal power series f hat um, and uh, use that information to deduce uh, 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 to, you know to understand the uh, what happens when we apply those operations on the exact solution f. And the reason this is appealing is because uh, normally uh, the power series f hat uh, are quite much more explicit, um, much more explicit than this ex you know, exceptionally transcendental function f. So it might be much easier to understand uh, operations in the f variable on f hat than on f. Um, okay. So any questions so far? Is that's, that's the strategy, very complicated strategy. OK, so, so then let's get, get into, uh, into the thick of it. Maybe I can make some comments. So yeah. can you go back up to the strategy? Uh, so when you say uniformly in x, right, what you're saying is that you want that f hat should be an asymptotic expansion in other words, that it should approximate the, the exact solution in a certain sense, but those the, the, the validity of the approximation should be uniform in that sector. Uh, no, in in uh, it should be uniform with respect to x. So uh, the approximate. So uh, when you're taking I when you say that f hat is yeah. the the asymptotic expansion of f. But but uh, I, I'm it, saying that the it should be the asymptotic expansion. Whose approximation is valid uniformly in X? Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> Otherwise, it's unclear what "do all this uniformly" means. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. The other thing is, maybe people can notice, in case you're not familiar with this, that when you look at the Laplace transform and you have e to the, if you look at the kernel for the Laplace transform, e to the minus c over h bar, then you'll see 
why Nikita is picking the right half plane in the H bar plane. It's for this reason, because otherwise the, the e to the minus one over H bar will, will have a wild singularity as you go to zero. As long as you remain inside his sector, then uh, this, you know, this will be well behaved. At least at the zero at the zero endpoint, it will be well behaved. Okay. Okay. So um, so let's do step one. So let's. Uh, I'll be quite brief because this this part is really quite easy. So uh, let me do try to find formal solutions first, um, and I'll kind of sequentially build up to what the uh, the correct assumptions should be for the theorem. Um, so, so what does it mean to solve, to find a formal solution? Well, I, I'm going to look at, uh, you know, the formal version of my Riccati equation where I will re really just replace all my coefficients with their respective uh, asymptotic power series. And I expand this in powers of h bar and try to, uh, try to solve at each order. Um, so you obviously begin with the leading order equation. Uh, that's this equation, leading order, the leading order in h bar. And uh, so here's the cool thing. This is why this is really appealing, and this is why this is really helpful and works. Uh, because of the way my differential equation is perturbed, the differentiation element in my equation is multiplied by uh, a power of h bar, which means as I expand in orders of h bar, uh, the the derivative always gets bumped up into the order higher than uh, where I'm testing. So in particular, in the, in the leading order, I don't even have a derivative. This is not no longer a differential equation. This is an algebraic equation. In fact, uh, uh, it's just a uh, quadratic polynomial for F0, um, which is easy to solve. So, uh, so if I look at the discriminant of that uh, leading order equation or leading, I call it the leading order discriminant. Uh, so that's defined by uh, the familiar formula. Uh, all of these are holomorphic functions on, on U. So this is a holomorphic function on U. And so um, in order to be able to uh, get so, you know, dis two distinct solutions on U, I just need to require that my leading order discriminant doesn't vanish anywhere on you. Um, so zeros of the leading order discriminant or in this instance are often called turning points. Those are always basically where, they're always the places where singular perturbation theory breaks down and, uh, and they're always to be avoided. So I'll, I'll do the same. Um, so I will, I will assume from now on uh, that you, my open set, my simply connected open set has no turning points. Um, and um, so the good thing is, uh, if I make, do make that assumption that I'm guaranteed that there's always going to be at least one holomorphic solution of the leading order equation. So, uh, I mean, you should expect two uh, solutions, but one of them might be, might be meromorphic at the places where uh, the leading order, sorry, the leading coefficient A0 has zeros. Uh, but it turns out that at least one of the two solutions is always holomorphic. So I'm always able to choose. Uh, as, as soon as the leading order discriminant is not zero, not vanishing, I'm always able to choose at least one holomorphic solution. So, um, so let me choose one of the leading orders, uh, holomorphic leading order solutions. Let, let me just label it F not plus. So it's a holomorphic function on U. Um, that gives me a choice of the square root of the discriminant. Um, simply, you know, this is just a, basically the quadratic formula. Um, and that is also a holomorphic function on u because, because u has no zeros of the discriminant. Um, uh, and also notice that it's non-vanishing. Uh, very good. So, so excellent. So, so now I'm going to proceed and continue expanding my Riccati equation, my formal Riccati equation in powers of h bar and trying to get the coefficients at each order. And uh, so let me, let's just do the first order um, and you'll, you'll immediately see the, the pattern. So uh, if I kind of expand and uh, rearrange and uh, collect terms, what 
uh, what happens is, so on the left hand side, I have a derivative term. And on the right hand side, I have F1, which is the thing I'm searching for. I'm trying to solve for F1 and then some other stuff. And what you should notice is that uh, all the purple, of, of all the violet under, underlined uh, stuff is data that's already known. So I've already solved my leading order equation. I, uh, I chose a solution and this, in particular this term, even though it involves a derivative, it's actually differentiating a function that I already know. Um, so this is just a holomorphic function. Um, so in other words, this may look like a differential equation, but it's, but it's not. It's an algebraic equation. It's an algebraic equation for F1. In fact, it's a linear algebraic equation for F1. Can't be simpler. Uh, so the only, you know, the only uh, kind of condition uh, that needs to be met in order for me to be able to solve it for F1 is that this factor sitting in front of it is not zero. But of course, uh, once I plug in F0 plus the, leading, the holomorphic leading order solution, this term, uh, this factor is nothing but the square root discriminant, which I've already said is non-vanishing on you. So I can always you know, divide, basically solve for F1 and it, uniquely, and this is key. So, um, so this is cool. Uh, what you get is at each order, uh, you know, this, this kind of pattern just repeats at every single order. You can do uh, the exact same analysis. Uh, at each order, you get an, a linear algebraic equation for the coefficient that you're looking for, for FK. So no more differential equations. And um, uh, okay, so here I just wrote down the formula for F1, just solved for it, uh, rearranged and, and divided by uh, the square root discriminant. So not, uh, not much, not much happening here. Uh, right. <clears throat> so, um, right, so that's the idea. So you, you solve for each coefficient FK at each order H bar, you get this big, uh, but explicit recursive formula for each coefficient FK. Um, and the key thing is that at each order, uh, you you solve uh, you, you get a unique solution, and so therefore you put them together into a power series. You get a unique formal power series solution, f hat plus I call it. So once I've solved, once I uh, once I've looked at my leading order equation and I've chosen a solution that determines for me uniquely uh, a formal power series solution. Um, right. Uh, okay, so now uh, now I'm going to move on to the next step, which is where I'll try to promote this formal solution f plus hat uh, to an actual exact solution. And so for that, I need to introduce a bunch of things, um, uh, starting with uh, something that I want to require of my domain u. I want the domain u to have a certain geometry. Uh, so one, I want to kind of point out that already in this formula, uh, we see an appearance of uh, an important object, which is uh, this derivative, uh, derivative scaled by you know, the inverse square root discriminant. Uh, uh, somehow uh, at, every, at every order in H bar, as I solve for my formal solution, the dependence on the derivative is it, it's not the dependence on the derivative, but rather dependence on the derivative scale uh, discriminant. Somehow that's uh, uh, yeah, that's a key observation. It's an observation because so let me go next. So so I want to consider this vector field, this holomorphic vector field on U, uh, d by dx uh, divided by square root delta naught. Um, and uh, I want to consider its real forward flow. In other words, I'll take this vector field Lx, I'll take its real part, that is some kind of real analytic vector field, um, and I'll flow it, uh, and I'll only flow it for positive time. So that's what I want to do. So, um, so if I do that, I get trajectories on my set U, and, uh, and I can describe them explicitly. So if I, um, <clears throat> if I choose a point x0 inside my domain u, and I look at the trajectory emanating from it, then I can basically write down an explicit formula for this trajectory. And this explicit formula looks, uh, looks like this. 
um, so let's see what's the best way of saying this. Um, so if I yeah, if I look at this uh, at this formula, so it, it just analyzing this as a as we normally do analyze flows of vector fields, you immediately arrive at uh, having to uh, uh, describe this integral. So you're just integrating uh, square root of the uh, square root delta naught um, uh, from from your base point x naught, where you're supposed to be evolving your trajectory from, and um, and you're looking at so this is supposed to be a real uh, positive flow. So real means I want to keep the imaginary part of this integral zero. So that. Uh, that's the meaning of the flow being real, but I also want it to be forward or, or positive in time. So this uh, real part of this integral has to stay non-negative. So I collect all such points and they assemble into a trajectory. Um, and, uh, and of course this, this real part of the integral uh, gives me a kind of natural time parameter of the flow. Um, and um, uh, let's see what I want to say. Uh, yeah, let me just sorry quickly skip a point. Um, so it, it gives me this uh, natural time parameter on the flow, and I want to consider my flows complete, complete in forward time, which just means that uh, if I start uh, at this point x naught and start evolving it using the flow of this vector field, that I can evolve it for infinite positive time. Um, so in other words, so here's what I say, right, that this uh, uh, forward trajectory is complete if uh, this real forward flow exists for all non-negative time. In other words, if I choose any uh, positive or whatever non-negative time, there should be a point, necessarily unique point in my trajectory, whose, uh, wh which appears in the flow precisely time tau. Okay. So let me now skip back uh, to this point. So go, going back to this uh, formula, uh, if you've ever studied a little bit of uh, exact WKB, this uh, or not even, sorry, not exact WKB, just, just WKB analysis, WKB approximation, this may look familiar. Um, uh, this, um, this transformation, coordinate transformation is often called, or at least related to uh, the Louisville transformation. Um, and um, what else do I want to say? Right, so because I've assumed uh, that my domain U is simply connected and has no turning points, that means you know the integral doesn't vanish and it's single valued. Uh, that means this is actually a biholomorphism. So it's a, it, uh, it is a holomorphic change of coordinates. And I'll use that in my construction. Okay, so, um, right, so all of that being said, uh, the assumption, a crucial assumption on the geometry of the domain U is that I want uh, all these flows, all these trajectories emanating uh, from points in U to stay in U, and I want them to be complete. So in other words, I want this domain to be forward complete for the vector field. And uh, so the picture you should have in mind is here, I drew a kind of blobby, uh, cartoon. So here's my domain U in yellow. Um, there's a point that I chose and, uh, and I started to flow it. So that's the trajectory emanating from, uh, from my point. And what should, so this is, and, you know, the typical situation is that these flow trajectories usually, uh, they flow into some kind of singular point of my equation. So it could be a pole or it could be a point at infinity where my uh, differential equation has singularities, something, something like that. So this is this is the typical situation that you should have in mind. And so, so the the condition of being complete is that you know every point can be flown for infinite positive time, and it stays within you. So all of that, all all the domain U kind of gets sucked into this whatever uh, this uh, limit point. It may not be a limit point in general, uh, but in all Nice cases, it, it is. Um, okay, so here's some useful facts about domains of this of this kind. So first of all, um, 
if I have a forward complete domain and I look at its image under the Louisville transformation, then the, the image is basically, it's essentially a horizontal strip or a semi-infinite horizontal strip in the image. Um, so what I mean by that is, is the following. So let me fix some base point X star in U, which, uh, which is going to define the Louisville transformation for me. And then I'll apply the same Louisville transformation to the entire set. Um, so call the image omega. So that's uh, some domain inside you know, the receiving variable, uh, complex, uh, receiving complex plane C sub Z. Um, the, the cool thing about this image uh, domain omega being the image under the Louisville transformation of my forward complete domain is that it has this kind of forward flowing or, or rightward flowing property. That if I, if I choose any point Z naught inside the domain, then the entire ray, the entire positive ray emanating, the entire positive horizontal ray emanating out of Z naught stays within omega. So, so that's the, you know, the picture of omega is basically like this. So I have uh, this infinite horizontal strip, infinite, uh, you know, towards the right. So um, if I pick a point Z naught, which, you know, has to be an image of some X naught in my original domain U, then uh, the entire horizontal ray emanating out of it stays within, within omega. And of course that, that horizontal ray is nothing but an image of a, a complete trajectory emanating from X naught. So basically, so the cool thing about Louisville transformation is that uh, this complicated geometry, which apparently I need in order to solve my differential equation, uh, the Louisville transformation really just straightens it all or, or straightens it out uh, in the it, it kind of in the image through the Louisville transformation. Everything is completely uh, simple and straightforward and, and straight and horizontal. Whereas of course in the in the original domain U, I mean even this picture that I drew is very cartoonish. Uh, even in this in simplest cases, it, it, it actually looks much more complicated uh, than this. The, these trajectories would spiral in. That would be the typical situation. And it's very, very complicated looking. But somehow legal transformation takes care of all of this. Um, right. Actually, the other thing that I want to kind of make uh, an off-the-cuff remark is I, I find it curious also that um the you know the, the kind of result that uh, at least originally i was trying to obtain the, the kind of existence uniqueness results i was trying to obtain for the ricati equation is more uh, kind of a, i was looking for more of a local statement i didn't really necessarily care about the global aspects of this result but uh these constructions necessitate the, the fact that even if you're kind of looking for local information they depend on some non-local data associ uh, associated with your differential equation. So even if I want to find the, uh, you know, prove a uniqueness, existence uniqueness results for my differential equation in just a small neighborhood of X naught, in order to proceed with the construction, I need to have the information uh, about my differential equation in this entire uh, forward flow. So somehow it's, it's kind of like a semi-local uh, information that I need. I don't need all the global information about the differential equation, but I do need it along this flow. Um, so yeah, I find that quite curious. Okay, so that's a useful fact number one, that once you uh, transform through Louisville transformation, everything becomes straight and horizontal. And then a related fact to it is that every point uh, in my domain U has a, what I call a compact substrip neighborhood. So um, that means the following. So, so let's look at the picture. So this is my U, here's my point X naught. Let me fix a small compactly contained uh, neighborhood of it, U naught. Um, and, uh, and what I'll do is I'll just flow it forward using my vector field. So it becomes some kind of uh, you know, strangely shaped domain like this, this uh, violet or pink. Um, so the, it's just the, the union of all the trajectories emanating out of U naught. So I call that U naught plus. Um, so because this 
domain u0 plus is the flow of u0, uh, its image, uh, which I call omega not plus, is literally a horizontal, you know, a semi-infinite horizontal strip that looks like this. It's just a, it's just like a tubular neighborhood of this uh, ray coming out of the image of x naught. And, um, uh, and moreover, because u naught, I chose it to be compactly contained inside uh, inside u. This substrip that I get, substrip neighborhood of this ray, is it necessarily has some kind of non-zero uh, constant margin for, uh, between it and the boundary of my original strip. So, um, so, so somehow in the you know in the x domain, it looks like there's no way. Uh, you know, the for, this uh, forward flow domain U0 plus would be, in, you know, in, in some sense compactly contained inside U because, you know, the boundary of this flow domain kind of gets closer, infinitely closer and closer to the boundary of U. But, but somehow that's false. That's the false perception. And it's the false perception because we're thinking of it for the kind of the wrong vector field. For, for the vector field D by DX, that would definitely be uh, no way to achieve kind of compact con uh, containment. But the vector field that we are interested in is this, uh, this L sub X vector field, which is divided by square root delta naught. And that vector field is, uh, well, complicated and singular at these points. And so in the image, actually, these kind of domains do become very nicely separated or very nicely nested in a compact way. So those are the, these are the kind of domains that I, that I want. So I call them uh, compact substrip neighborhoods of points. Um, okay, and then, um, so that's point number two. And then point number three, which uh, is also related and it's kind of obvious, but it's so important that it's worth stating. This, uh, this complicated vector field Lx, which is d by dx divided by square root delta naught, uh, if I if I take this Louisville transformation by holomorphism and push it forward, then all I get is just you know your usual standard favorite uh, vector field constant vector field d by dz. Um, and of course, the statement it doesn't matter which base point you choose, uh, yeah, it, you always get this relation. So so this is yet kind of another uh, uh, another formula that suggests that the Louisville transformation really straightens out the geometry associated with my Cartesian equation. OK, so uh, any questions about this geometric uh, picture in the x and the z plane? Hi, good question. Good. Yeah. Oh, uh, I was wondering if, when you straighten it out, there's anything to say about if it puts the Riccati equation in a normal form. Uh, it kind of feels that way. Uh, I'm not sure if there's a, well, I certainly don't have a statement of the form, but it kind of feels that way, yes, yeah. I mean, I guess it would make the discriminant equal to, to Yes, one. yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly. From that point of view, for sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, just, so you, you, you can't have periodic trajectories because omega is assumed simply, sorry, u is assumed simply connected, right? Um, ah, right. Is that? Is that the only reason you can't have periodic ones? And and would would the analysis later go horribly wrong if you allowed this to be periodic, right? Because no, still I the think, level. Yeah, I think I can. Uh, yeah, I think I can certainly allow it to be uh, periodic and therefore loosen that. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I made this condition here just for simplicity, uh, but there's no real reason to assume that U is simply connected, as long as you, you know, careful about. I, I mean, you know, in that case, for instance, phi becomes multi-valued or something, as long as you kind of take care of that. But that's precisely what periodicity uh, is, you know, the, the periodicity that you're mentioning, uh, that's where mm. it comes from. So I I think it could totally be made to work there, yeah. I mean, you want square root of discriminant to be single valued, don't you, on your, on, I mean. But, yes, but that's, okay. that's right. That's that's something you would want. Yeah, but then the integral, of course, doesn't, uh, it doesn't matter, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Any any other questions? 
Okay, so um, right. So okay, so that's that's the discussion of the kind of geometry I want on my domain U. Um, then the the other uh, things that I want to require in order to proceed with the construction is some asymptotic regularity on my coefficients in V, A, B, C. So, um, so I'll try to define this carefully, knowing that uh, many of you may not have seen even uh, you know any kind of asymptotic analysis. Um, yeah, these definitions are very uh, basic, uh, so don't don't be afraid. Um, okay, so um, so recall that I began by assuming that my coefficients a, b, c at least uh, admit uh, locally uniform asymptotic expansions as h bar goes to zero along this uh, half plane arc A. Um, so it turns out that that is, uh, those conditions are too broad and uh, uh, they're, not, uh, they're not refined enough in order to be able to capture, um, in order to be able to get, uh, essentially in order to be able to get uniqueness in some very strong sense. Um, so, uh, so you need to kind of impose a little bit more on the way uh, these asymptotics uh, are valid. So let me go through that in detail. So first of all, what does it mean to be asymptotic along an arc? Well, um, so, Imagine um, I take a function f, which is defined on some domain u cross uh, a sectorial domain s, just as before. And s has opening a. And actually, for all these definitions, it doesn't even really matter if a is kind of a opening pi or not. It could be very general. Um, but OK, so, so we say that f, a holomorphic function f, admits an asymptotic expansion as h bar goes to 0 along this arc a if the following is satisfied. So um, there is a formal power series, f hat, uh, with holomorphic coefficients on u, which is going to act as the asymptotic expansion. Um, and uh, the condition that you need is the following, that um, so uh, for any n, any x, and any sub sector, S not inside S. So this is a proper subsectorial domain, uh, which means that its opening, A not, is compactly contained inside A, meaning that if I take A not and uh, it's an arc, some arc of uh, directions uh, sitting inside A, another arc, and I take the closure of A not, that still sits inside A. So it's kind of properly smaller than A. So if I take such uh, you know, such a triple n, x, and s naught, then uh, I can basically derive a bound, a bound on the difference between my original function and the truncation of my power series. So the bound is like this. So there's a constant, a real constant, c, uh, which is allowed to depend on n, x, and a naught, all this data that I've just, that I've just picked, um, such that the remainder, the nth remainder, uh, which, as I said, is the difference between my original function f and the nth truncation of my power series. So I just I take my formal power series and I throw away the tail after step n. So this is this is also a holomorphic object. This is a holomorphic object. So this difference is a holomorphic object, and I want that to be uh, bounded uh, as h bar approaches zero. And the bound, you know, the size of the bound is given by my constant c. So it, this this difference cannot grow faster than the nth power of h bar uh, multiplied by some constant. Um, so that's that's the usual definition of asymptotics. Um, and then um, right. So in this case, the usual note, you know, usually people write uh, the notation is that f. Is asymptotic to its power series, its uh, asymptotic power series f hat as h bar goes to zero along this arc a for all x in u. So this is basically pointwise asymptotics. And then, um, so if you want to then uh, 
you know, increase the regularity of uh, this kind of asymptotic condition, basically the way you do it is by, by specifying exactly how you want this, these coefficients C to depend on, on N, on X, on A naught, and all this rubbish. Um, so that's so that's exactly what I'll do. So first, um, you want things to be uniform or locally uniform. Uh, so you say that f is asymptotic to f hat as h bar goes to zero on a, uniformly for all x in u, if we can choose these constants c in such a way that they don't depend on x. So we can choose them uniformly for all x to hold for all x. Um, and then, of course, you can you can do this. You can relax this. So that that's a very strong condition. But you can relax this to be uh, locally uniform. Um, in which case, all you need to do is just uh, kind of uh, every point in U, every point x naught in U, should have a neighborhood where I can make this uniform choice, but not necessarily globally of U. Um, okay. Uh, so it turns out that for my purposes, neither assumption is good, uh, and I need something in between. Uh, so uh, uniform, uh, sorry, uniform asymptotics is too strong, uh, but locally uniform asymptotics are too weak for me to derive my result. What you need is, um, so remember, my uh, domain U has this geometry of being a kind of complete flow domain, forward flow domain. And so in particular, that meant that every point has a neighborhood, which is uh, this compact substrip that is like a small, compactly contained little disk, which I flow for infinite time. And so it is on these kind of subsets, these uh, compact substrips that I want uniform asymptotics to, uh, to hold. So, so I will say that F is asymptotic to F hat as H bar goes to zero along my arc A if, uh, 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 and this is to be valid for all X and U uniformly on compact substrips, if we can choose uh, these constants C uh, in such a way that they, uh, you know, on any compact substrip, I can choose it uniformly for all X, but not necessarily over all U. Okay. Um, okay, so that, that's what uh, you can do kind of in terms of uniformity in the X direction. Um, the other thing that you can do is, um, you know, the other thing that these constants C depend on is uh, this opening arc uh, A naught, which uh, I said should be kind of strictly smaller than my original arc A with a, with a little margin. Um, and it turns out that you know normally, um, as you let a naught become larger, uh, kind of increase uh, to uh, kind of approach this, you know, start getting wider and wider approach a, then these constants c n, which depend c n x a naught whatever, which depend on a naught. You, you would need, to, in order to maintain these kind of estimates, you would need to take them larger and larger and larger. And so as A naught approaches A, uh, these constant might explode. So this is the kind of behavior that you want to avoid. Um, so, so I say, this is not very standard notation because I think there is no standard notation for this, but, but basically what you want to do is, uh, so you, you say F is asymptotic to F hat, as h bar goes to zero along the closed arc a naught, sorry, at the closed arc a bar uh, for all x in u, if we can choose these constants c uh, in such a way that they just don't depend on a naught. So you can choose them uniformly for any, for any such a naught. Um, this is a slightly strange condition. It doesn't really appear in asymptotic analysis too often. But uh, there is a yeah there's a, there's an extremely good reason for this uh, for this condition as I'll explain in a second um, yeah okay so last but not least probably most important assumption is uh, so yeah so so these constants so I explained how you can specify the dependence on x how you can specify the dependence on on a naught what remains is n. You can also specify how you want your constants to grow 
or depend on n. So the simplest, probably the, the simplest and maybe most useful way of uh, uh, defining a class of asymptotics, which is good for uh, a very large variety of uh, reasons, is called Givre asymptotics, uh, sometimes also called one, or often called one Givre, because there's an entire tower of uh, similar kind of restrictions. But I'll just I'll just focus on the the simplest and, as I said, probably most important instance of it, which is one Givre, uh, just called Givre. Um, and that is to specify how these constants C depend on n. So we say that F is Givre asymptotic to F hat, and I use this kind of uh, fancier asymptotic symbol. So F is Givre asymptotic to F hat as H bar goes to zero along A for all X and U. If we can choose these constants C to depend on N essentially in, a, in at most a factor factorial fashion. So the coefficients C grow with N basically no faster than a factorial. So uh, more precisely, there's a, there's a constant C and a constant M, both independent of N, such that uh, each of these CNs uh, is, uh, well, this constant C times the, you know, the uh, M raised to the power of N, and then importantly, N factorial. So this is this is the simplest Givre asymptotic condition that you can impose, and it turns out to be extremely powerful. Um, okay. So so basically, I will want to I I will want my coefficients a, b, and c in the Riccati equation to satisfy all of these. <laughs> um, okay. So here's my assumption, my assumption two. So the coefficients a, b, and c. Um, yeah. So uh, not quite the coefficients a, b, and c. I, I still have to do something extra to them. I have to rescale them by the square root discriminant. So if I rescale them, uh, then I want those uh, rescaled coefficients, those I want to admit uh, Givre asymptotics as h bar goes to zero along this closed arc a. And I want that to happen uniformly on compact substrips. Okay, so uh, in symbols, so I rescale them, I, I divide each coefficient by square root delta naught. Um, and that is Givre asymptotic to uh, their asymptotic expansions also rescaled by the uh, square root discriminant um, as h bar goes to zero along this closed arc uniformly on compact substrips. So that's the assumption that I want. Okay, so let me just, you know, I said a lot of words. Let me just try to spell it out. Uh, perhaps it will be clearer this way, what I want to assume. So let's say for the coefficient a, um, what I want to assume is that uh, if I pick one of these uh, compact substrip neighborhoods inside uh, my domain, complete domain U, then I can find two constants real constants C0 and M0, uh, they're allowed to depend on this compact substrip neighborhood, but not on anything else. Um, so, so I'm able to find uh, such a pair of constants such that um, for any N and uh, any point in this compact substrip neighborhood, this uh, remainder, the nth remainder, which is the difference between my uh, function my coefficient a and uh, the nth truncation of its power series, that is bounded. Uh, so first of all, it's bounded by. I think we got it. We got it. You go go forward. It's this just you're just repeating what you said before. Let's, okay. Let's keep going. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, so that's that's the explicit. Okay. Um, right. So one remark that I want to make is. Uh, that um, so these constants C not and M not, uh, they may, if I start choosing uh, this compact substrip neighborhood larger and larger such that it, whatever its boundary approaches the boundary of U, then these constants C not and M not may explode. Um, and, uh, and in fact, this is the kind of behavior I want to capture because the kind of domains that I have in mind 
normally would have turning points on their boundary. And so uh, if they have turning points on their boundary, then uh, I would not be able to, you know, because I'm, I'm taking my coefficients, dividing them essentially by the discriminant, uh, they would start, they would grow unbounded um, as I approach those turning points. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, um, uh, that's a phenomenon that I want to capture. Okay, so some quick facts about uh, this Givre asymptotic business. Um, so first of all, this stuff with uh, larger, uh, sorry, with these closed arcs, asymptotic, asymptotics along closed arcs. So first of all, if I, if if my function p were actually defined on a you know a larger sectorial domain with a strictly larger opening, uh, then simply from definition, if I restrict it to a smaller sectorial domain, it would have uh, these asymptotics along a closed arc. So, so what you should normally think, in fact, I, I suspect this might be the case that if, if a function admits asymptotics along a closed arc, it admits an extension to a holomorphic function on a slightly, you know, slightly bigger domain, a sectorial domain. Um, yeah, that, probably that's true. Um, okay, so that's remark number one. Remark number two is that if you're still thinking of coefficients which are holomorphic at h bar equal to zero or even whatever constant, that they are uh, kind of trivially givre along any closed arc. Um, okay, let me give you a couple of examples. So here's a, here's a nice function, e to the minus one over h bar that has an essential singularity at h bar equal to zero. But if I, I look at it in the right half plane, then uh, in that sectorial domain, it admits asymptotics as h bar goes to zero. In fact, it's asymptotic to zero in that sector. <clears throat> and um, and it is, uh, so it is asymptotic along the open arc, but importantly, not along the closed arc, simply because uh, the two directions, you know, pi, plus pi over two and minus pi over two, my function becomes uh, oscillatory uh, as I approach h bar equal to zero in those directions and and that uh, that really ruins my um my bounds my asymptotic bounds so that's an example of a function that doesn't that it does have Givre asymptotic but not in a closed arc in particular if if you approach from either the positive or negative imaginary axis there is no limit Correct. but if you have you know if if a function is Gervre in a sector, it has to have a limit along every right. direction, right? So it cannot yeah. blow up in that sector at all. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> right, okay, so here's a, here's a kind of a complicated example, highly non-trivial example. Um, <clears throat> so let me take this function E of X H bar, and it's defined as this integral along the positive real axis going from zero to plus infinity. Um, probably you recognize immediately that I'm taking a Laplace transform of something. This is nothing but a Laplace transform. Laplace transform of this one over uh, x plus psi. Um, so this is a holomorphic function on uh, whatever the, uh, the complex plane x. Uh, I can remove the negative real ray and let me restrict it to the right half plane and the h bar. So this this is a nice looking domain of the the type that uh, we've been considering u cross s. And uh, it's not difficult to show that uh, the that it has that it, it admits uh, an asymptotic expansion in the right half plane. Um, uh, actually, this is a formula for it, and you can see in this formula. Uh, that my coefficients, the coefficients of the asymptotic expansion, they they basically grow factorially. There's this k minus one factorial. Um, so uh, so this is a kind of a giveaway that this is probably a Givre, uh, Givre asymptotic expansion, and it is uh, again not too difficult to show. Um, and in fact, uh, this is a, a, an example of a function which admits Givre. Uh, a Givre asymptotic expansion um, as h bar goes to zero in the closed right uh, half plane arc. 
um, yeah, and the re so in this case, the reason for that is because this function admits uh, an extension to a larger sectorial domain. Um, and uh, yeah, so the other thing that maybe uh, note is um, this asymptotic expansion is valid uh, only locally uniformly in X because there's a problem at the origin. So if I take you know, subdomains that come closer and closer to the origin, then the coefficients of my asymptotic expansion start growing unboundedly. But if I kind of take even unbounded domains that go off to infinity, but they always have some kind of finite margin away from zero, then those are, uh, uh, I can make the, this asymptotic condition uniform. So um, yeah, so I think this is a good example because it kind of captures many of the things I've already said. Um, so, uh, you know, one of these unbounded domains where I would try to make a uniform asymptotic statement could be one of the flow domains. Um, and the flow would go off to infinity. So I would want uniformity on that large open set. Okay, so the probably the most important thing uh, about um, Givray asymptotic uh, expansions is this theorem. Uh, of Nevandana uh, from early 20th century, which was later rediscovered by Alan Sokal in, I think, the 80s, uh, which somehow is completely unknown. Well, not completely unknown. It's, it certainly is not as nearly well known as it should be. Um, I've been told by people from kind of hardcore asymptotic analysis that people don't know this theorem because it's in practice difficult to use especially because of this uh, asymptotics in closed arcs condition. That, is, that seems to be difficult to achieve. But from, th from a theoretical point of view, which is what we need here, it's, it's perfect. Um, it, it basically tells you, um, it, it gives you a, a very concrete way of how to identify uh, divergent power series with certain regularity with actual sectorial holomorphic functions. It gives you precise conditions on both sides such that uh, the such that you can you can build a one-to-one -one correspondence. Just like you so you kind of what you should think of is the usual uh, theorem, we don't even call it a theorem that allows us to identify a holomorphic function with its power series uh, you know near some point. And we, we don't usually think of it, we take it for granted. But it is an identification that we make. One is a is a function object. The other one is a germ at a point. But there's a one-to-one -one correspondence given by the Taylor expansion. Um, so, uh, so kind of Nivalna Sokal theorem is in the same spirit. Um, okay. So let me let me go let me uh, walk you through the statement. So uh, suppose I take a formal power series F. Uh, so formal power series with holomorphic coefficients on U. Um, and uh, suppose I apply uh, what is called the formal Borel transform to it. So by definition, uh, this is uh, this is going to be a power series, call it F, uh, call it phi hat, power series in a new variable psi. And um, the formula, the formula for the formal Borel transform is quite simple. You just take, uh, you replace uh, H bar to the K plus one, you replace it with Xi to the K and you divide the K plus first coefficient by K factorial. So the, the main operation is, is division by factorial, K factorial. Um, heuristically, uh, uh, you know, given what I said about Givray asymptotics earlier, which is that, where is it? Which is that they're supposed to grow at most factorially, that uh, this formal Borel transform seems to be kind of a, the very appropriate tool to get rid of that divergence. Because if my coefficients diverge at most factorially, and I div and I remove that factorial growth by simply just by dividing it, then I get growth which is uh, which is just uh, um, exponential. Uh, so you you should expect to obtain something convergent, and. Um, so that's, uh, that's basically the purpose of the formal Borel transform. Um, so 
Okay, so suppose um, so suppose I took my formal power series F hat and I applied this formal Bohr, Borel transform to it, um, and I found that uh, this this power series phi hat, which is the result of this transformation, is uniformly convergent on U. So uh, it's some uh, uniformly convergent power series of psi. Um, then uh, the following two statements are equivalent. So on the one side, you have power series, and on the other side, you have holomorphic functions and sectors. So on the power series side, it goes as follows. I take this formal Borel transform, which is now uh, a convergent power series in Xi. Um, suppose it admits an analytic continuation to uh, a neighborhood, uh, an epsilon, kind of a tubular epsilon neighborhood of the positive real axis in the Xi variable, such that um, this analytic continuation has at most exponential growth as I go off to infinity. Um, and you know, and I want all these statements to be uniform in X. So the exponential growth is uh, uniformly valid. The, the rate of exponential growth is uniformly valid for all X and U. Um, uh, right, so explicitly what that means is uh, there are two constants K and L such that uh, if I take this analytic continuation phi of phi hat, then uh, it's bounded by some kind of exponential function, something that grows at most exponentially. And this is uniformly valid for so. So, <clears throat> so that's uh, that's that's the power series side. On the holomorphic function side, uh, suppose uh, there is a, a holomorphic function f, which is defined on uh, this domain U cross some sectorial domain with opening A, which is half, half plane opening. Um, and, uh, and suppose this function F is such that it admits uh, a Givray asymptotic expansion as H bar goes to zero along a closed arc. So here is very important uh, that it's the closed arc A. And again, I want this statement to be uniform. So, uh, Nivan and Sokal theorem says that if uh, phi exists and satisfies this exponential growth condition, then there is such a holomorphic function f with this property, which which admits phi, uh, which admits f hat as its asymptotic expansion, and uh, vice versa. If I started with uh, a holomorphic function f, which admits this asymptotic expansion with this strict regularity. Then, uh, if I if I take its asymptotic expansion f hat, apply Borel transform, then that Borel transform does admit an analytic continuation with at most exponential growth. Um, and so, um, so yeah. Moreover, if uh, if one of these statements is the case, then these functions phi uh, f and phi are in fact unique. And they're related by some of the transformations that we've already encountered. So on the one hand, F uh, is essentially the Laplace transform of this analytic, analytic uh, continuation of the Borel transform. So uh, more precisely, F is, uh, you need to add, as usual, add the leading order term, which is always, it always gets swallowed in the Borel Laplace uh, transformation. Uh, so you always have to add it. Um, but, uh, but the rest is just the Laplace transform of this analytic continuation. And, uh, and on the other hand, the flip side of it is that this uh, analytic continuation phi is, uh, is the analytic Borel transform of my original function f. So what is the analytic Borel transform? Um, it's, uh, it's an integral, it's an integral tran uh, transformation where I take f, um, and I integrate it against this strange looking kernel. It's kind of singular kernel. Um, and, uh, and I need to be careful about what kind of uh, paths I integrate it over. Uh, so these are, uh, I don't know, I call them Borel paths or uh, boundaries of Borel circles. So if we look at this picture here, so this is a picture of my sectorial domain S again. So remember that S have exactly half plane 
so this arc A goes from minus pi over two to pi over two. And so I want paths, these uh, paths of integration to be uh, necessarily kind of starting shooting out of minus pi over two being asymptotic to the, uh, uh, you know, the straight minus pi over two direction going around, staying inside my uh, sectorial domain S and entering again asymptotic to the plus pi over two direction um, into, into this endpoint of the, of the arc A. So here you kind of see why, uh, why it is really important that my function F that I'm integrating, uh, that it's asymptotic regularity really extends in some sense the boundary of this arc because uh, because I, that's how I'm, I'm integrating it. I'm integrating it from one boundary point of this arc to another. And in fact, the, the, the fact that this Borel transform, that this integral is even well-defined, that, uh, that it converges, comes straight from the fact that I can make my asymptotic um, uh, bounds on F in a, in a uniform way for all possible sub arcs A0. So that is uh, directly uh, a direct input into the existence of this uh, analytic world transform. Okay, uh, any any questions about this so far? Um, uh, so the, the uh, actually, what are you viewing as the kernel of this uh, of this thing? E to the um, c over h bar divided by h bar squared. Yes, I think. Yeah. Okay, and uh, so the the function, the function f of x h bar. If you look at its values along a, it, it has values along a, right? What's its? Yeah. How do, what is its behavior? What is its limiting behavior? Or in other words, if you restricted it to a itself, what would it give? Uh, it would just be the limit of of f. Uh, and how does it depend on here. angle? How does it depend on the? That doesn't depend on angle. It's constant along A? Yeah. It's just the value at H bar is equal to zero, you mean? Well, if, if it were holomorphic, yes, yeah. So uh, part of the condition of admitting asymptotic expansion means the limit exists. So the limit. Right, so th th its limit is assumed to exist um, as H bar goes to zero in the right half plane. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it has to be, uniform from minus pi over two to pi over two angle? So uh, the, the limit, limit the limit is going to be, I mean, the limit doesn't depend on the angle. So it either, it, right. if it exists, it's constant. And if it doesn't exist in the direction, uh, well, then it doesn't exist. So think of e to the minus one over h bar. The, the limit is zero along any direction. But then if you take the limit along, you know, specifically in the direction, pi over two or minus pi over two, the limit doesn't exist. But if you changed the, the if you changed beta, um, keeping its endpoints fixed and and you know then then it would give the same integral. So this is kind of yeah. like a period. But yes. on the other hand, if you change the position of the endpoints, that will also change the integral, right? Uh, well, so in fact, if I I I think if I push the one of the endpoints into A, then uh, then my integral is going to explode, because because you, because uh, this grows exponentially. This kernel grows exponentially as I go. Oh, I'm the... sorry. I see. So, um, I see. It's not e to the minus c over h bar. Mm -hmm. It's e to the c yeah. over h bar. Yeah. Somehow so... it's like if I if I could extend my function. You know, yes. to a larger sector, yes. then I would be able to integrate like this, right? And then there would be there would be no question, you know, so to speak, there would be no question about the existence because I'm integrating something uh, against, I'm integrating f against something that decays exponentially as I approach. Um, but, but just so that I understand, the function is defined on the right half plane and has right. nice limits on the right half plane, but mm -hmm. the kernel has well be, is well behaved on the left half plane. Yep. And yep. instead of having an overlap region, you're just assuming that they, they just butt up against each other. Yep, exactly. And you, the, the tool you're using for that is the uniformity. But in yep. principle, 
you could imagine that they would have an overlap and you were really trying to go from one region of overlap yeah. to the other. So in fact, in fact, if I assume F to be holomorphic at h bar equal to zero, then you can show that this, uh, you can rewrite this integral as actually nothing but taking the residue of this function, this F times E to the psi over h bar over uh, h bar squared, the residue of that function at uh, h bar equal to zero. So this is, this is nothing but the residue integral. That's why also there is this one over two pi i showing up. Hmm. It's, it's just it seems when, to be some kind of this seems to be some kind of like a ser duality pairing. I mean, yeah, yeah, exactly. Have, yeah, I I don't know. Anyway, uh, okay, maybe we can dis discuss later. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's kind of what I've been saying to you previously. I think I think it's something like that. Yeah. Um, okay. Right. Okay. So now I think I have managed to define uh, everything I need in order to be able to state the theorem precisely. Um, yeah. So now I have now I have all the assumptions. Okay. So here's the the main theorem. Um, so so let me recall some of the things that we've fixed previously. So I fixed a domain U, which I asked to be simply connected. I fixed sectorial domain S which I asked to have opening exactly length pi from minus pi over two to plus pi over two. And I was looking at the Ricard equation, which is this uh, ODE, where the coefficients A, B, and C were holomorphic functions of X and H bar uh, in this uh, domain U cross S, um, such that they admit asymptotic expansions as H bar goes to zero locally uniformly. So since they do, that means I can proceed with the formal analysis and in particular consider uh, the, the leading order discriminant and see if the leading order discriminant has zeros, et cetera. Um, and uh, the assumption, the first assumption, the overarching assumption that I want to make is that uh, on this domain U, my leading order discriminant has no zeros. So there are no turning points. Um, that means there is at least one leading order, holomorphic leading order solution. I call it F zero plus. It's a holomorphic function on U. That fixes for me a uh, square root of my uh, leading order discriminant, delta naught, just given by this formula. And that uniquely also determines uh, a single formal solution to my Riccati equation with uh, holomorphic coefficients on all of you, f plus hat. So that's all the input data. I mean, all, all the choice that's been made is uh, the holomorphic leading order solution. Everything else kind of cascades down uh, recursively. <clears throat> then I um, do the two assumptions. First, the assumption on the geometry of u that I wanted to be forward complete domain. And then um, the asymptotic regularity assumption uh, that I want these uh, rescaled coefficients a, b, c, rescaled by square root discriminant uh, to admit uh, Givray asymptotics along the closed arc a bar uh, uniformly on compact substrips. Um, then, uh, if these conditions are met, uh, it turns out that there is a unique exact solution, call it F plus, which is a holomorphic uh, in X belonging to U um, and uh, admits asymptotics along A. Um, and what makes it unique is that it, uh, it has this very strong asymptotic uh, condition that it satisfies. Uh, which is that it is asymptotic to this formal solution f plus hat. Um, and the asymptotics are Givray. Givray as h bar goes to zero along the closed uh, arc A and uh, uniformly on compact substrips. Um, and uh, moreover, uh, this exact solution f plus 
uh, well, it just from the way it's constructed by using the Borel Laplace method, it, uh, it is the Borel resummation of this uh, formal solution F plus. And this Borel resummation, um, I kind of I keep striking this point as being important, the, all the uniformity statements. This, this statement is uniform on these, uniform, on these uh, compact substrips. The reason it's important is because now all kinds of properties about F plus that I would want to know in particular, for instance, how what is the limiting behavior of F plus as I flow it along this uh, flow of the vector field? So as, as I go into the singular point of the equation, how does F plus behave? I can deduce that now from looking uh, at the formal solution. It's that how do the coefficients of the formal solution behave as I as I flow it into the singular point? And that is much simpler because I have basically explicit formulas for all the coefficients of S of F hat plus. Um, so that's kind of, yeah, that's, I can't stress this enough that it's, it's very finicky, but it's very, very important. Um, okay, right. So, and just, just to kind of restate in formulas, the, the last sentence that I said that F plus is the Borel resummation. So what, what it really means is that it is obtained through this series of very complicated sounding operations, which is that um, I take, I look at my formal solution F plus hat, F plus hat. I apply the formal Borel transform to it. Uh, that uh, happens to converge near Xi equal to zero. And it happens to admit an analytic continuation along the positive real axis. And that analytic continuation doesn't grow too fast at infinity, such that if I take its Laplace transform, which is basically integrating it along this uh, cycle uh, positive real axis, that this, um, this integral is well-defined and exists. So that gives me some holomorphic function to which if I add, um, as I always do, the leading order contribution F0 plus, uh, that gives me uh, a holomorphic function which, uh, which turns out to be a solution of my Riccati equation, basically, at that point for, for trivial reasons. Okay, so any questions about the statement? Can I ask it somewhat pedantic? Yeah. yeah. Uh, what is your notation for Javray? Like, how, where is it specified in the theorem that it's here and here. And is the um, um, when you stated this uh, Nevenlina Sokal theorem, uh, um, is the is the condition about the formal Borel transform is that automatically satisfied if the F hat has Javray asymptotic? Uh, which which condition do you do you mean? You um, mean this? What are you referring uh, to? In the statement of the in this the Nevenlina Sokal yeah, theorem. This is Nevenlina. Like you you said right above that this is a fact about Javray asymptotics. Yeah, very so important fact. Wondering uh, yeah, so where does the Javray asymptotics come into the yeah. statement? Yeah, I want, uh, so in the, on the analytic function side of the statement, I want the function f, the whole of the function f to admit Javray asymptotics. Yeah. It is, the, the theorem is false if I, if I use, you know, uh, more general Poincaré asymptotics. So can you detect? Make... Sorry. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I was just wondering, can you detect the Javray asymptotics just from the F hat, or do you need F as well? Yes, you can. You can detect Javray asymptotics from F hat uh, simply because, uh, like, if you look at this example, for instance. Uh, so I, I gave you this holomorphic function E, and uh, I can find. Uh, it's asymptotic power series. Um, and uh, you know, when I just compute the coefficients, this has nothing to do with bounds or anything, right? It's just some computation. 
um, so no statement about the regularity. But I can see that the coefficients of this power series, they grow factorially. So that means, I, I didn't define these things, but that this, this means that this power series is, in this case, it would be locally, uniformly, one Givray power series. So, mm. and uh, uh, that's basically, you could say that that's an alternative definition of Givray asymptotics, that if, if the coefficients of the asymptotic power series grow at most factorially, then, then you'll be able to get these bounds uh, on the, the nth remainder uh, to be at most factorial. So, yeah, those, so those two that, statements are equivalent. So is, is that then, like, if the, this f hat in the statement of the Neva and Lina SoCal satisfies that definition of one traverse, does condition one automatically follow or something like that? No. Um, unless, unless you have the function f at hand already, which is asymptotic to it, uh, just f hat being one Givre is not enough. Oh, okay. uh, far, yeah, it's far from being enough. Um, all kinds of things could go wrong. Uh, the thing that goes wrong most typically is that the analytic, you, you know, you, you take his Borel transform, of course, that's going to be a germ at psi equal to zero. So you can start analytically continuing it, but that could encounter singularities. Um, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah that's then, what I was wondering about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. Thanks. Okay, any, any other questions? <clears throat> okay, so, let me give you some idea of the proof. Um, uh, so maybe let me just kind of go over the main steps, uh, which is it's a kind of refinement of the main the, the general strategy of uh, Borel summation of so the Borel Laplace method. So um, yeah, so I'll kind of do a diagonal. Uh, I'll go through this diagonally. So, okay, so step one is, um, so I kind of the first thing to do is I need to do a series of transformations on my Ricotti equation in order to put it into a form which I can attack with some kind of integral operator uh, approach. So the first, uh, uh, the first stage of these operations is to remove the leading order part and the next to leading order part of the Riccati equation. Um, so removing the leading order part, this f plus, f zero plus, that is absolutely vital uh, in order to proceed with Borel-Laplace method. Um, otherwise, it just wouldn't work. You get uh, you get singularities, um, uh, unwanted singularities. Removing the next leading part, order part is more kind of a convenience. You, you don't really have to do it, but uh, it's just more convenient. Uh, right. So, so if I do a transformation like this, where so I've removed the leading order part, and now I removed the next leading order part in this uh, in this fashion, uh, then basically I go from I, I transform from the unknown variable f to the unknown variable s, and uh, by manipulating uh, and rearranging and dividing by square root discriminant, what you find is, is a, a, a new Riccati equation for, uh, for this kind of remainder S. And uh, this Riccati equation is of this form. So you have uh, H, H bar multiplying, uh, now you can see the appearance of this vector field that I keep talking about, uh, minus, minus just a kind of free term S. Uh, and then everything that sits on the right-hand side is already of order at least H bar. So indeed, uh, like uh, Francis mentioned uh, some time ago, uh, you know, one of the reasons why I put my Riccati equation into this form is that if you look at the leading order discriminant of this Riccati equation, that's just one. So I've sort of, um, yeah, some kind of normal form type operation. Um, and the other important thing is that because I've divided all the way through by the square root discriminant, 
these coefficients, a, these new coefficients, a prime, b prime, c prime, uh, they basically look like this. So a is literally divided by a square root discriminant and uh, b prime and c prime are essentially of the same form. So my assumptions, remember, I assumed this uniform uh, Givray bounds on rescaled coefficients. So somehow now I don't, I get uniform Givray bounds without having to rescale anything in this, in this equation. Uh, so that's nice. Um, okay, step two uh, is to get rid of this horrible vector field, um, apply the Louisville transformation. So whatever fixed sum base point in U and uh, transform, what you get is uh, a much simpler looking uh, Riccati equation. Um, so it's it's kind of of the same form, except the you know the derivative operator is now very straight. Um, and uh, so this is now an equation uh, on this infinite horizontal strip cross S. Um, step three is uh, so now th this is the equation that I'm going to apply the Borel transform to. And in fact, I'm keeping everything analytic. So all these, this is still, uh, this is not a formal Riccati equation. It's an analytic Riccati equation. And so I'm applying the analytic Borel transform rather than I want to stay, I want to stay analytic. So, um, oops, sorry, uh, let me keep that. Right, so, so, uh, so I'm applying the Borel transform to this. So it's basically, I'm changing my uh, independent variable from capital S to sigma, sigma is the Borel transform of S. And, and, and here's where I use all this heavy machinery that I mentioned before, in particular with the Van der Sokal theorem. Um, the, so the fact that I need is that each one of these coefficients A, AI uh, in my equation, they, are, uh, they admit Givray, uniform Givray asymptotics on these uh, compact substrips in the closed arc A. Um, and therefore, by the Bandler's theorem, when I take the Borel transform, um, I am guaranteed that, that thing is a holomorphic function defined on, uh, well, on the infinite horizontal strip cross a uh, tubular neighborhood of the positive real axis in, in the psi space. So this is what I call W1. Um, and these and these holomorphic functions, which I've called alpha i, they um, I can take the Laplace transforms. They are Laplace transformable, so they they, they grow grow at most exponentially as psi goes to infinity, and um, and then I have this relation between uh, uh, between the original function a i and uh, its Borel transform alpha i. So I'm going to use that. Um, okay, then. Then I also need to use two other properties of Borel transform, which I didn't discuss, but they're very easy to show by using, for instance, the integral equation, uh, the integral definition that I that I gave. So one is that if I um, dividing by h bar uh, gets transformed into differentiation by the variable psi, um, and then um, the product of functions. Uh, gets transformed into a convolution product of functions in, in the Xi variable. So in particular, for example, if I, if I transform this term A1 times S, uh, if I apply the Borel transform to it, then uh, I should take the convolution product between the Borel transform of A1 and the Borel transform of S. And then there's also an additional term, which is the leading order part of, of, uh, of AI, of A1. <clears throat> Okay, so anyway, so you use all of these kind of uh, simple formulas, and what you find is that you can rewrite uh, the Riccati equation that uh, with all the capital coefficients as a as a PDE. Um, so the reason you get a PDE is because so if you look back at this, um, I want to I will divide this equation through by h bar, and so I'll I'll get. Uh, just d by dz of s here, but then uh, here I'll have h bar inverse s, and then the right hand side uh, I just kill the h bar. Um, and so d by dz of s transforms into d by dz of the Borel transform sigma, 
uh, but h bar inverse times s that gets transformed into differentiation by xi, d by d xi sigma. So, um, right, and then uh, so applying these rules, uh, you find that you know that's that's just the application of the Borel transform to the right hand side. You get all these convolution products. Um, okay, so now I want to solve this PDE, nonlinear PDE with convolution product. Uh, sounds daunting. Um, so the key is to convert this PDE into an integral equation. Um, and uh, here you use the, this kind of uh, horizontal strip or forward flowing property of the horizontal strip. The fact that if I choose a point in the horizontal strip, the entire ray is uh, staying with remaining inside my horizontal strip. So I, you do um, a coordinate transformation that looks like this. So I just, I shear, it's a shear transformation. I shear z by xi, um, and the the use of this transformation is that it transforms this uh, differential operator, which is uh, which is responsible, you know, which is appearing in my PDE. It transforms it into a single vector field minus d by dt, um, and so that I can just integrate. Um, okay, so. So once so so that's what I do. So I, I take this psi coordinate transformation. I transform uh, uh, my equation into the uh, w t variables. I get uh, an, a, a first order O D E. The left hand side just becomes minus d by d t. I integrate that whatever from zero to t, and I transform back. So that's what you see here. That's the operator. Uh, Right, so so that's uh, after this transformation. This is the integral equation that you get. So this integral operator is kind of is kind of interesting. Um, so you can write it. So here uh, I call it R, capital I. You can rewrite it uh, by doing a small change of variable. You can rewrite it as the integral of uh, you know. So if I apply it to some alpha, which is a function of z xi. Uh, what it does is it it integrates alpha, uh, but it shares each uh, input variable by plus t and minus t. So if I if I could draw a picture of what this integral operator does, is it does the following. So so this is my uh, so this is in the z uh, space in the z plane. This is my omega strip, and uh, let's say this is my point z. Um, uh, where I want to understand the value of my integral operator. So what it does is the following. So there's this infinite positive infinite ray emanating from Z. Um, and uh, so at least if I'm, if I'm thinking of Xi as being real positive, then uh, by using this whatever rightward flowing property of uh, my strips, Z plus Xi is going to remain on this uh, infinite ray. And so what uh, what this integral operator does is it kind of it int integrates my function alpha along this path from z to z plus xi, so along this interval where uh, the the values that it's testing as I'm integrating at this point are I'm just taking uh, my function alpha of z and xi, but then as I integrate along the interval. Uh, uh, the the value that it's taking that it's testing is uh, xi being equal to zero, or the second input being equal to zero, um, and then so yeah, and you should of course keep you should think that you know this is the kind of object that I'll I'll be taking a Laplace transform of in the xi variable, so I'll be I'll be integrating this thing as xi goes from zero to plus infinity, so that means at each kind of step in this infinite chain of integrations, I, I keep integrating my functions along uh, bigger and bigger intervals that eventually fill up this, this entire trajectory and go off to infinity. Um, so I think, I think I'll just say one last thing and that should, 
should uh, should do it. So basically, I've now rewritten my nonlinear first order ODE Riccati equation by doing all these uh, transformations, the Borel transform, the Liouville transformation. I first rewrote it as a PDE, which I then noticed that I can rewrite as an integral equation for this kind of strange looking integral operator. Um, and uh, so this integral, uh, integral equation it looks kind of complicated, but actually you can solve it. Yeah, you can solve it. In the, so I'll, I'll definitely skip step five. But the way you solve it is, at least the way I solved it, is using the method of successive approximations. So you kind of start approximating your solution to the integral equation one by one and correcting it at each step. Um, what that amounts to is defining a, a, a sequence, an infinite sequence of uh, functions, holomorphic functions, um, and they're given by these recursive formulas, which I basically got by trial and error, although there is some kind of guiding degree principle to writing down these, these formulas. But basically the nth term of this sequence uh, looks like this. Um, and um, yeah, and then the, okay, then the crux of the proof is the kind of the main analytic element of the proof, the, the hardest uh, part of the proof is to show that, so you, you take this infinite sequence, uh, you take the infinite series, you just sum all these contributions and that you need to show is uniformly convergent and therefore defines a holomorphic function and that it uh, is a solution to the integral equation and that it has this sub-exponential growth so that you can take its integral uh, that it, you can take its um, Laplace transform. So, okay, let me skip, skip, skip. Step seven, once you, once you do all of that uh, es estimating analysis, uh, which is long, not too difficult, but just long, um, then, um, then I'm guaranteed that Laplace transform of this sigma exists. Um, so I apply it and then do what I have been doing uh, all this time, add the leading order term, add the subleading order term because I've removed it for convenience and uh, my exact solution is defined this way. Okay, I think, uh, I think this should be enough. <laughs> Are there any questions? So you, you say that the, the WKV uh, thing is like a special case of this. Wh mm -hmm. Which case is that? Uh, so let me just go back to the equation. So in the, so for, for a Schrodinger equation, uh, A would be one, uh, B would be zero. And uh, C would be the potential. And uh, if you want to do uh, exact WKB on a, on a general second order ODE, then uh, B, B and C would be non zero, but A would be one. And then if you want to. So remember, I mentioned there's this exact WKB where Riccati equation shows up. But if you want to study, it's, but it's it's the quotient of the two WKB solutions. If you take if you take psi one and psi two and take their quotient, then that thing, which is you know instead of being no, no. So in if you're staying in rank two, so second order ODEs, then. Uh, the uh, then you're actually so you're solving for not for quotients of solutions but for actual solutions. However, I'm just saying that the, there's a, a typical correspondence between rank two systems and these nonlinear ODEs of uh, of order one, right? Oh. Which is really just the correspondence between working on a rank two bundle or working on its projectivization and choosing an affine coordinate. Oh, I so see. that's what this f is. This f is an affine coordinate on P one, mm -hmm. right? Which is describing the 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 
you know, one of the WKB solutions. I mean, uh, like a rank one sub bundle. Right. So you, you, usually you do it the other way. Yeah. Usually you explain, you explain the solution to the Riccati equation by converting it into a second order, uh, mm -hmm. sorry, into a first order ODE, which is linear. Right. But here he's, he's doing the opposite just because somehow it, um, I don't know, the, the tools are amenable to this, I guess. Mm -hmm. There's a question in the chat by Lisa. I don't know if you can read, the, uh, read it, Nikita. Mm -hmm. It goes there. Uh, just which said, transformation? Well, you had a transformation that took the product of two functions to their convolution. Ah, yes. And that's the yeah. same as the Laplace transform. It's um, it's the it's the inverse of Laplace transform. Laplace mm -hmm. transform sends convolution to usual product. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Right. But basically, yeah, basically, this, yeah, it's. I mean, it it, it in some very. Uh, concrete sense, those two operations are inverses of one another. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Could you go back to the PDE, please? Mm -hmm. uh, and the definition of sigma? Okay. Okay, and um, and this convolution is in the uh, is in the uh, C variable, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I see. And I, I see. And the, the convolution involves integration in this C variable along paths, which are what's the integration path for the convolution? Yeah. So it's it basically just um, uh, straight line segments from zero to psi or whatever. I mean, they don't have to be straight, just, but, but because this thing is simply connected, you just go from zero to psi. Uh, but but, the, but the, um, the convolution operation, <clears throat> you mean there's an, in, there's an integration along a finite contour going from zero to, zero yes. to psi? I see, yeah. okay. Yeah. And, okay, and then can you explain how are you getting the integral equation from this PDE? So uh, transformation, and then you yeah, make the, this definition. Yeah, just just this observation that this uh, coordinate transformation sends this vector field d by dz minus d by d psi mm -hmm. to uh, basically d by dt. Right. Okay. Yeah. And and then uh, and then you just well uh, now you have a first order uh, ODE. You integrate that. Mm -hmm. So you, you choose a slice, right? You choose, mm -hmm. it's like the method of characteristics. You choose a hypersurface, which is transverse to the orbits of the vector field. And the, you use that as the initial value yeah. somehow? I guess it's something like that, yeah. I'm not sure. So you're saying that the value of, of sigma at some point in the x c plane, or sorry, in the, um, in the w t plane, is, uh, is its value at t equals zero? plus the integration of its derivative. So that, that's what this equation at the bottom of the screen, at the bottom of the screen is, right? You're saying that it's, you're, you're choosing like t equals zero is the hypersurface where you're thinking of it as an initial value problem. Mm -hmm. right. And what, what is sigma of zero? Sigma of zero is just the value of sigma in these new coordinates. At, z, yeah. at so t equals zero. Yeah, so it's a function of w only. Yeah. I, I see. Yeah. Can I ask, what is t? It's like a, a sigma of z t. Then what should I put as the value of t? So, uh, so this is just a coordinate transformation. So uh, I'm going from coordinate z psi to w t, and I'm giving you formulas for w t as functions of z psi. 
So W of Z Xi is Z plus Xi and T of Z Xi is Xi, right? Yeah, W, T, they're just auxiliary coordinates for me to write down this formula. Yeah, yeah, no... The point is the value of T is the value of T depending on the value that you plug into sigma. But... He's, he's, I mean, T, T, the TW is irrelevant. It's the point is just that you have a PDE, mm -hmm. right, which is telling you that the derivative of this function in one particular direction is given by some expression, implicit expression, right? It's it's implicit dependence on the function itself, right? So you could just choose a slice and then say that the value at some future time in the slice is obtained by integrating this implicit mm -hmm. expression which depends upon you know, the value of the function. So it's an integral equation. Um, it's kind of like the obvious, this is an integral equation you can write for any PDE of this type, which is just a vector field applied to a function is equal to some, some, some kind of combination of that function or some expression of that function. Okay, and then can you, can you just, just uh, after this point, can you just uh, look at, go over the steps again? I just want to s capture this. The, the reason that I'm interested is because this, there, there's a lot of um, similarity with like th this integral, this convolution, right? It, you can express it as a, as a groupoid convolution using this, uh, this groupoid thing. And um, I'm just curious about why writing it as an integral equation is giving you so like, why is it, a, why does it turn out to be so useful actually to write it as an, as an integral equation rather than just as this PDE? What's the key, um, bonus that you get from this way of thinking? Um, you say successive, successive approximations. So yeah, the, the, the naive answer is that- you, do you, Presumably you, you, you kind of think of this thing as a, like a contract, you could probably think of it as a contraction mapping and get it from some very general result like that. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Wow. You should be able to, yeah. Um, but I mean, that, yeah, that just, I mean, that's what method of successive approximations is. It's, uh, it's a contraction mapping argument, just, just more explicit. Um, uh, can you go back up to the change of variables? What is the domain that, that you need this uh, function to... Um, yeah, what domain does sigma actually need to exist for? Like in, in which region does it need to exist? Sigma or opsi? Sigma. Uh, the thing that you're trying to find the solution, find ah, that it exists. Okay. Right. On what domain in the ZW, in the TW plane, do you need it to exist? I'm I, I, sorry, I'm asking a very simple question. You have a PDE, you convert it into an integral equation. Where does that integral equation have to have a solution? So the domain is, uh, is of this form. So what you want, so you want to look at, uh, so this is a horizontal strip in the Z variable. And this is a, like an epsilon uh, tubular neighborhood of the uh, real positive real ray in Xi. Okay, the W I'm fine with. What what is the omega one plus? Uh, it's a it's a compact substrip. So it would be it would be a compact substrip that that follows that trajectory into you know mm -hmm. to, to infinity yeah. into the spiral yeah. whatever it is. So, so there's this kind of su slight subtlety that I have. So I have omega, I have a compact substrate omega zero plus, yeah, where yeah. I'm constructing my solution. Yeah. And, uh, so, and then so you that's flow the that. Yeah, yeah, but, but the point is that, uh, so I did mention this at the beginning, but this omega one plus is a kind, I want to fix an intermediate substrate. And, uh, and the idea is that I'm constructing a solution on omega zero plus, but I'm using all the estimates from omega one plus. But is one, omega one plus is larger? 
Yes, Omega one plus is larger. Okay, but the, but the point is that 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 compact thing is being fl uh, flowed yeah. right to infinity, and yeah. so that that um, that uh, <clears throat> that you know road, if you want to call it that, the road to infinity. Um, that's where you need the double the sigma to be defined. That's where you need existence of, of yeah. the solution. Correct. And you need some control over its behavior along that road. Correct. So, so this is like um, you know once you get to the point where it's expressed as a PDE, what you're dealing with is a PDE in two holomorphic variables, which is really just a vector field. It's just a it's just a vector field. Um, uh, and that vector field um, has a trajectory. Well, I, I guess your vector field, you, you transform it into, uh, j just so that I understand, without doing all the, the changes of variable, right? In the original variable, we have this road, which is kind of like embedded or, or uh, some kind of open set inside the, uh, the original Riemann surface in the Z variable. Mm -hmm. And you, what you want is existence of solutions of a PDE Along one of its trajectories in in, a, in one of these road neighbor, neighborhoods, mm -hmm. and the the PDE is of the form vector field applied to function is equal to what? It's equal to some um, something which is not a differential expression, right? It's it's con it convolution operators, mm -hmm. but these convolution operators involve uh, finite differences or something. I integrals al along trajectories, which all remain inside the road. Yeah. So, is that right? Okay, so. So I think kind of exactly what you're saying is expressed precisely in this domain where the, uh, that I'm defining. So uh, this intermediate omega one is defined, like it has a margin from omega zero where all my solution yes. to be defined. Find. Yeah, and and the 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 margin between the two, I want that to be you know no less than some epsilon, and that epsilon is exactly the width of the tubular neighborhoods over the real ray in psi. So that means when I'm when I take a point z in omega zero, and add psi from the tubular neighborhood, I'm not going to exit. Yeah, yeah, this I got region. it. Yeah, I got it. I got that, it. I mean, so that's, that's why I idea. asked the question. Yes. Yeah. But, okay, but so l let me just phrase it a different way. Suppose you had a PDE. Um, oh, okay, actually, here, here's an intermediate question. So is it really important to that it's a PDE in two variables or can you just restrict to like one ray, like, uh, mm, uh, you know, W equals constant and make an argument for W equals constant? Uh, you, I think you do need a PDE. Uh, because what you're using is Nivan Linus theorem, so I'm scrolling back to Nivan Linus theorem. And uh, the thing is that uh, you need, uh, so we're basically, we're, we're, we're doing something, we're going from one to two, that's the construction in the theorem in, uh, for, the, for this exact solution, uh -huh. we're going from one to two. And here you need uh, analytic continuation uh, in you cross a, a an actual I understand. I understand, but but let, let, me, let me. Okay, so maybe what I'm thinking is the following: that you, you have to show existence of solution to this nonlinear equation, right? Mm -hmm. And but but the equation is d by dt equals something, and that mm -hmm. something never leaves the t line, right? right? So that means that for a fixed value of w, that thing is defined. There's a restriction map from solutions to solutions for fixed w. That's what uh -huh. I'm wondering. I just wanted to verify that that is the case. Um, I'm not sure mm. because all of the all of the convolutions they have W fixed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I'm not sure. Is it not obvious that uh, the convolution has W fixed? It is not because uh, you see W does depend on Psi because this is a shear transformation. Psi, psi is a shear by Psi, uh, by Psi. 
Oh, I see. But, mm -hmm. okay, but maybe I'm misunderstanding W. It's, it's more that I, I, I'm just kind of imagining whether the entire thing restricts to one path, one trajectory of the vector field. Yeah, so that's, I think this is related to this really finicky point of um, needing to obtain asymptotics in the closed uh, arc A. Yeah, I understand, but see, like, you could imagine that there is some, some PDE which is telling you the, the, the variation of the function along the trajectory of this vector field as it goes, goes to, to some singular point. Right, and if you understood how the solution depended upon the given data, then you could try to, then you could try to understand uniformity as you change which trajectory you're looking at. Mm -hmm. But what I'm more concerned about is whether the, whether the thing, whether the, the the differential equation that you're solving is essentially one dimensional, or whether it's, I understand, you know, or whether this integration is somehow probing nearby paths, which I doubt it 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 is. Um, Or, or yeah 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 it's okay i mean we, we could discuss it later but I, i'm i'm just kind of curious like for example the type of equation that you that you have is something like you know uh, d by dx f is equal to f of x multiplied by f of x plus 1 suppose mm -hmm. right so imagine you, you had a, a differential equation it's nonlinear and it's non local because it's like the derivative of f at the point x is equal to the product of the value of f at x and the value of f at x plus one, mm -hmm. right? So this is somehow analogous to your PDE that what you've written there. I see. Mm -hmm. Right, and so you you can't. Um... I mean, it's analogous. Yours is more complicated because you have to integrate a number of expressions of that type. Um, it's just interesting because it, it seems to be like, um, it, it's, it's almost like it, it, it's related to like a finite difference equation. Um, It would just be nice if um, if there was another class of problems into which this thing fit, which we could have a general result about, you know, like, um, uh, I mean, it, it started, I think that everything that you, you've, you, you said was um, somehow you were, you were somehow doing exactly what you're supposed to do, right? Like you're, you're some, somehow using the correct tools to do the correct thing, assuming that you're gonna do this Borel transform and so on except for one part where you um, where you said that by trial and error or something, you knew how to solve a successive approximation. I mean, that is, that should obviously be encapsulated into some, some kind of um, analytical result about solving certain types of ODEs. They're nonlinear ODEs, right? But the cool thing about it is that, is that the, uh, the differential operator, which is occurring in the in the PDE, its flow is what is being used to do mm -hmm. the right hand side nonlinear non local parts. Mm -hmm. So it's the same operator that is occurring as a differential operator and as a difference operator by exponentiation. So that's very um, that's very fascinating. I mean, I've, I haven't really seen um, a theory of those. Does it make sense what I'm saying? Kind of, yeah. Mm -hmm. But it depends on whether it's true what I'm saying. I mean, I don't, I don't understand exactly the the convolution notation in the in these variables. Can you say how you got this sequence? Because 
like in the examples that I've seen where you have integral operators, you just have to do like an iteration and prove that it converges. But here it looks like you have to do something a lot more clever. Yeah, there's, <clears throat> I mean, I, when I said that I got this formula by more or less trial and error, I, I didn't lie. Um, there is some kind of guiding principle about getting the degrees right. So, um, so okay, so, well, okay, the, the fact that sigma zero has to be that, that's, that's obvious. The fact that sigma one has to be this, that took me a while to get. Um, but then you kind of, uh, it, it's almost as if um, the uh, like <clears throat> so look, look at sigma two. So sigma two is you need to integrate uh, sigma one. So that's uh, one kind of one degree down from uh, from sigma two. Um, you also need to integrate alpha one convolution sigma naught. So it's as if convolution has, it's, it's as if it carries degree one with it. Um, and, then, uh, and then you see that repeating here as well. So sigma naught and sigma naught, they have degree zero, but they're convolved and that has degree one. So somehow this is the only bit of the right-hand side that you can ship out that has uh, degree, uh, degree one. And then uh, you look at uh, sigma three, you kind of have a repeating pattern. So you have uh, sigma one convolved with something. So that's that should be degree two, one down, etc. So that's the the guy. It's, it's you know, it's, it's just a guiding principle that led me to writing down the correct thing. Then once you once you write, so like if you look at this horrible formula, uh, you know that's. You, you can even see it here, actually. Like in this top top degree term, I'm summing only up to n minus three, and that's because I have I have two convolution terms appearing. So uh, that's as I said, it's a it's a guiding principle. But then, yeah, the, actually checking that this satisfies the integral equation is pretty simple. Yeah, the, the really difficult thing is showing that it's uh, uniformly convergent. That's that's quite hard. Well, it's not too hard, but just long. And you have to estimate stuff. What happens if you just take i and apply it over and over to the same thing? Yeah, I mean, Maybe that would also work. I'm not quite sure. I haven't tried. Um, I mean, that sounds more like uh, these kind of uh, fixed point arguments. Um, hmm. I mean, one advantage of having this formula is that it's it's very explicit. Um, so in particular, people interested in uh, the whole business of resurgence what you what you mentioned earlier about uh, being able to continue this phi analytically continue this phi and you are you going to encounter singularities well in general it's you know it's very difficult to analytically continue functions and uh, let alone understand where they have singularities well here you have i mean it's a very complicated formula right it's an infinite sum of uh, some kind of integral convolution involving things um, defined recursively, but it is a formula. It is a formula. And so my hope is that maybe at least in some classes of examples, these formulas can be used to actually pinpoint locations of singularities in the Borel plane. Oh. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, so in your main theorem, you have a few assumptions on, on the domain U and the coefficients A, B, C. Do you expect, or is there any sense in which those assumptions are necessary? Like, do you have a good list of uh, instructive counterexamples or something like that? 
I don't. Um, yeah, the, the, the simple answer is, as you go through the proof, at some point, you need these assumptions, and these seem to be the the most loose assumptions that you can ask for the thing to work. Um, yeah, I mean, there there are there are several ways in which you can relax these assumptions by kind of uh, upgrading or or doing other transformations, and I discuss several of them in the paper, um, but they're all kind of not like they're not very severe uh they're pretty mild uh mostly just transformations okay um, yeah so i don't know if these things can be relaxed but at least at least all you know these assumptions capture loads of examples uh, yeah, of course. classes of examples that that we really care that i really care about lots of people really care about at some point, you said that you wonder if, like, there was an assumption which was too strong and another one too weak. This too too strong one is it because uh, it outputs things that are not as regular? Uh, so yeah, so this was um, this had to do with uh, this uniform uh, on compact substrates. So I could have asked for this for these conditions to hold uniformly on U. And that would have been okay, uh, no problem. So the only thing is that it excludes a large number of interesting situations where U has turning points on the boundary. Okay. So if that happens, then uh, there's no way you can make these asymptotics uniformly on U. But uh, yeah, so, but if you, if you relax that assumption in this way that you only restrict to kind of substrips, then you can proceed and you get a solution and everything is fine, even, even though you have these bad points on the boundary, so no problem. Thank you. But somehow the fact that it's uniform, you know, all the way into the end of this flow, that is on a, like that you cannot avoid. That is crucial. So if that doesn't hold, you're screwed. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Very nice talk. Thank you. Thanks for Thank you. I know I know it was quite heavy. <laughs> no, no, that was very well explained actually. Yeah. Yeah, it was really good. I liked it. Thanks. I'll grill you later. I need to read read your paper more carefully. But that's a good appetizer. Right. Right. At least I, I think this is the first time I managed to actually get to stating the theorem precisely. <laughs> yeah. It's just, it's crazy. Like preparing this talk alone just made me realize realize how much I had to learn in order to finish this project. I mean, before I started, I'm not even sure I knew what an asymptotic expansion was. I mean, come on. Like, when did you start this project? How, how long did it take I, you? So I basically, I basically started it during my PhD uh, and I made a very different argument to prove a theorem similar to this, which I thought was enough. Uh, but then as I tried to apply it to, I mean, the reason I, you know, the reason I need results like this is because I want to proceed with my abelianization nonsense. And for that, I need, I need this, these things. And so I proved a kind of a similar looking result using much more basic techniques. Um, and then as I tried to apply it, I realized that it's not good enough. It doesn't give me what I need. I can't mm -hmm. do with it. it so first of all, it's just an existence result. And it's a, it's a very poor existence result because I basically cannot conclude anything about the solution. And um, yeah, anyway, it was just rubbish. So then I went off and tried to figure out how to do. And uh, first was a, a very long, several months, if not like years of denial where I thought, you know, like people must have proved this before. Like this just seems so, so classic. I mean, this must be in the literature. So I would look and look and uh, think for the longest time, think that, well, you know, clearly I'm just not understanding the statements that I'm finding. It must be what I need must be in there. And, and then finally I 
convinced myself and others convinced me that no, it kind of really doesn't exist because this this Borel Laplace method is, although it's the method itself is not very recent, but somehow it's it's resurged recently and not really been applied properly. Um, so the fact, yeah, so so then. The fact that I get this uniqueness and uniformity is super important because then I can use I can use those to conclude all kinds of yeah like ask me anything and I'll probably <laughs> well, no no I'm, I'm kidding <laughs> yeah it, what it seems oh, sorry go ahead oh, sorry. Francis. I was just wondering there's the this uh, stop sharing. supposed result of Koike and Shapke. So right. what, what, how does that relate in terms of the... Uh, I asked that question. <laughs> you asked that question, where did you ask it? I asked that question like during the talk, remember? No. I did. I did. During this talk, you asked the question? Well, I said, what, what's the, what, what's, which case is the WKB case? Oh, oh, I see, I see. Well, yeah, so that's, that's one. Uh, okay, that, so that's one uh, way in which those results are special, uh, special cases of what I proved. The other thing is that uh, what Koike Shafke. So maybe at this point we should stop recording because 